Hey there, it's Suzanne Hogan. You're listening to A People's History of Kansas City. Seventy years ago this week, the U.S. Supreme Court announced a decision in Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, a collection of five cases where black children wanted to go to the same schools as white children. The court said separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. The landmark decision ended legalized racial segregation in U.S. schools, paving the way for more civil rights victories in the years to come. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. But what people might not know is that Kansas was uniquely poised to be a battleground state in the fight against segregation. In fact, five years before the Brown decision, it was a Kansas Supreme Court case from Johnson County, spearheaded by women, that laid some of the groundwork for this national victory. What I said was, this is wrong, and we're going to do something about it. You wait and see. It was a beautiful sight when you could see those ladies I knew I wouldn't have a job, but that was all right. I was trying to help, see. She was determined to see to it that every public school in the entire state was integrated. So that's the story you're going to hear this episode. The story of Webb v. School District 90. The two schools at the center of it. And the community that pushed for equality with everything they had. Here's Mackenzie Martin. A lot of people played a part in the Walker School case. Lawyers, children, parents. And we're going to zoom in on three of them. Three badass women who all contributed to this movement in different yet equally important ways. And I want to start with Corinthian Nutter, a teacher. Right before Corinthian Nutter died in 2004, she gave an interview about her life to a community member named Greg Rickey. Uh, I'm in Shawnee, Kansas with Mrs. Corinthian Nutter. And uh, we just established that you were 96 years old about a week ago. Greg remembers that he liked Corinthian immediately. She had a wonderful spirit about her. She didn't take herself too seriously about anything. In fact, she was sort of self-deprecating. I don't think I've done anything. I'm just one of those people that enjoy what I do. And if I happen to be- She made you laugh a lot. She did. She was fun. What brought you to Kansas City? That's the longest story you ever heard. (laughs) It's true. Before I get into Corinthian's role in the Walker School case, you just got to hear how she ended up in Kansas City. Her story starts in North Central Texas in 1906, when Corinthian is born to strict black Baptist parents, the kind who give all their children Bible names. I never got to go anywhere without being chaperoned by my oldest brother. So at 14 years old, Corinthian gets married. It was the only way I could get away. But the marriage isn't what she thought it would be. So they separate when she's 16. And Corinthian is suddenly alone, trying to figure out where to go next. When she meets this girl from Kansas City. She said, honey, she said, you ought to go to Kansas City, honey. You ought to see what they do at these nightclubs. The entertainers, you know, they get up and put their dresses real tight around them and they just switch around. I said, mm, 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 Lord have mercy. Corinthian says to herself, I gotta see these nightclubs. So she packs up and moves to Kansas City. When Corinthian arrives at Union Station, she doesn't know anyone, so she goes to the YMCA, where they hook her up with a local guy to live with, musician Willie Mac Washington, the drummer in Benny Moten's band, who is a really big deal at this point in the early 1920s. And she said it was the wildest, most pleasurable time of her life because all these great jazz musicians were trooping through there all the time. She said, I wish I had a nickel for every time Count Basie played my piano. Yes, that Count Basie, famed American jazz pianist Count Basie. My house got to be the party house. For a lot of people, this would be the life. But the thing you got to learn about Corinthian is that she has her own dream. She had a deeper burning inside, and that was education, something that she lacked growing up. My mother could not even read her letters or write her name. Back in Texas, Corinthian was expected to work in the cotton patches, so she barely, if ever, went to school. When I was 16, I had never been inside of a junior high school, but I was determined to. Corinthian decides she has to get an education, so she gets a job doing hair and starts going to classes. 
First, she graduates high school, then a junior college program at Western University in Kansas City, Kansas, making her a certified teacher. She loves it. And a couple years into her career, she finds herself teaching at a small two-room grade school, attended only by black children in South Park, Kansas. Today, it's part of the city of Miriam. But back then, it was this working-class garden suburb south of Kansas City. They called it the Walker School. Walker School. They said it was named after Madam C.J. Walker. I think it's important you know all of this about Corinthian, how hard she worked for an education, how much she valued it, because her role in what happened at Walker School put everything she had worked so hard for on the line. See, Walker School was pretty run down. Whatever was there was broken down. And around 1946, the parents of the black students started complaining to the all-white school board, asking them to make improvements. But the movement didn't really pick up steam until 1947, around the time that a white Jewish woman named Esther Brown got involved. She's one of the other big protagonists here. What was your relationship with Esther Brown? Well, the truth is, Esther Brown is ahead of everything. One of the first things I learned about Esther Brown is that she was not afraid to tell it like it is, starting with what she thought about Walker School. Incidentally, to really describe this school, it was almost unbelievable. To start, Walker School's playground equipment consisted of things like a swing set with no swings, and the only bathrooms were outside. Which I thought was ridiculous in this day and age. Inside, a bare light bulb suspended from the ceiling in the basement, illuminated rats running around, and standing water. Water would accumulate in the basement that would be, oh, I don't know, two and a half to three or four feet high. The children in that school were always having the flu and the colds and the pneumonia. Part of what made Esther so furious is that three blocks away from Walker School sat a brand new school, South Park School for white children only. South Park School had nine teachers to Walker's two teachers. And unlike Walker School, it offered kindergarten, had a sizable auditorium, and operated a school lunch program. At its core, this whole story is about these two schools and the vast disparity between them. Of course, none of this directly impacted Esther Brown, because she lived farther south, in Miriam, Kansas, in a much wider, more middle-class neighborhood. She loved to go to the city. She loved to have picnics. We always have big Passover dinners. Esther's daughter, Susan Brown Tucker, says her mom had this presence about her that made everyone sit up and pay attention. She was incredibly beautiful and charismatic and fun. If you're envisioning Esther as this white, 40s, do-gooder housewife, though— Let me just stop you right there, because her motivations for getting involved here are much more complex. She had interests outside the house, which made her different than a lot of uh, our friends' mothers, made her more interesting. I read that they were socialists. Yeah, I mean, this is always an interesting question, what it means to say someone was a socialist or a communist. Born in Kansas City in 1917, Esther Brown is just a kid when her mother dies. So she's mostly brought up by her father and uncle, Russian Jewish immigrants involved with radical leftist causes. They regularly take Esther to labor union meetings and stuff like that, greatly influencing her early political views. And it's important to note that at this time, the American Communist Party is organizing the unemployed and fighting for racial equality. I think definitely her orientation was to be concerned about inequality, workers' rights, oppression. By high school, Esther is picketing for garment workers and spending summers at Commonwealth College in Arkansas, a suspected communist stronghold. And all of this at a time when communists are being persecuted by the U.S. government. Today you have in charge of the Communist Party a hardcore fanatical group of members who are dedicated to the overthrow of our government by force and violence. Esther is investigated for suspected communist ties several times, starting in her 20s. No official charges are ever filed, however, despite an official letter to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover recommending as much. And of all the causes Esther's involved with, and there are many, none is more important to her than her mission to correct the Walker South Park School's disparity. Growing up as kids, 
we heard about the South Park case and the South Park story, it was almost like a myth. It was like a fairy tale. You can hear it in the way Esther talks about the case. Because around 1970, right before she died, she self-recorded a first-hand account of the whole lawsuit on tape. She was actually undergoing treatment for breast cancer at the time. So it's this incredibly candid record. One of these days, if I have time, maybe the tape can be spliced or I don't know what you do. The story begins one day around 1947. Esther's talking to her black domestic worker, Helen Swan, whose children go to Walker School. She was telling me that they want to float bonds in that community to the tune of $90,000 to build a brand new South Park school. This was the white school. Of course, while black families' tax dollars would be paying for this theoretical school, no black children would be allowed to attend. And I said, well, why don't you ask for improvements in your school? Maybe this will be your chance to get it. Helen Swan tells Esther that a group of Walker parents had, in fact, already asked the school board if they could include improvements to Walker School in the bond as well. But no dice. They were told that um, they didn't have any money, but that they would give them a stop sign and a mailbox. A stop sign and a mailbox for a facility that is regularly overcrowded and flooding. I thought this was pretty crummy and uh, said to her, Mrs. Swan, maybe I ought to go to your school board and talk to them. Being white, they probably listen to me where they don't to you. Despite the many people who speak to the school board, the measure passes without any improvements for Walker School and the new South Park School is built. But rather than being discouraged, the Walker parents are just getting more and more fired up. They hire a lawyer and form a South Park branch of the NAACP. And one of its charter members is none other than Walker teacher Corinthian Nutter, who you've met before. And I was already teaching up there. I'd been there six years, my sixth year. This is risky for Corinthian, to say the least. Across the country, teachers are shying away from anything to do with these types of lawsuits for very real fears of professional repercussions. When school was integrated, non-white teachers were the first to get fired. And Corinthian does get fired. After she starts lobbying the school board for improvements with the parents, the school board doesn't renew her contract, something she seemingly takes in stride. Well, I knew I wouldn't have a job, but that was all right. I was trying to help, see. As ragged and as angry as I was most of the time, I uh, was working for Factor 11 in the first place. Simultaneously, Esther Brown is trying to learn everything she can about the school board budget, that kind of thing. And the school board invites her to speak at another meeting. But this time, when Esther arrives at the South Park School's gymnasium, she finds an overflowing crowd of 350 agitated white people. Among those in attendance are the school board. They look like a bunch of lynchers from the South. And the principal, who officially supervises both South Park and Walker School, but reportedly couldn't be bothered to visit Walker School more than once or twice a year. He was kind of a, a pipsqueak kind of a person. Like I said, Esther Brown does not mince words. Virgil Wisecup, head of the school board, opens the meeting by saying there is a, quote, race problem in Miriam. Then it comes time for Esther to speak. I tried to make the point that I knew that what the Negro parents wanted, they wanted better educated children than they had had an opportunity for themselves. And that this just couldn't be done in this kind of a building. And that maybe if some of the people would go down and see their building, they could see that they needed improvement. And before I had a chance to finish, somebody stood up and said, you go back to where you came from. We don't need any outsider telling us what to do. And then people began to move away from me. And a woman in back of me wanted to hit me, and some man caught her arm. And I didn't know what to do. And I sat down, and then I stood back up, and I said, but I beg your pardon, but I was asked to come here and speak. And I said, Mr. Weisskopf, you asked me. And he was on the platform, and he put his hands on his hips and said, I did not, and left the platform. And there I was. And everybody began to hoot and holler and jeer again. They began to call me all sorts of terrible things. Of course, it was at this point that I realized that this meeting had been called for my benefit to intimidate me. I was so furious. I 
don't know when I've ever been madder. I, I only know that that I was so angry at the injustice of the whole thing that all I could think about is, what am I going to do? Esther says this is the moment that everything changes for her. And she realizes those black kids, they don't just deserve improvements to their school. They deserve to be in this school with this huge auditorium and more teachers. They deserve to have everything these white kids do. What I said was, this is wrong and we're going to do something about it. You wait and see. By this point in the story, Esther and the Walker parents are starting to realize they have a case, a good one. Because the way the school board is operating these two schools is illegal for several reasons. One, it's a violation of the landmark U.S. Supreme Court ruling in 1896 known as Plessy v. Ferguson, or separate but equal, which stated that segregation was okay as long as each facility was equivalent. Clearly not the case here. The second reason it's illegal is slightly more nuanced. It's because Kansas law only permitted segregation in elementary schools by race in cities of more than 15,000 residents. My former KCUR colleague, Dan Margulies, broke it down for me. Towns like South Park, that city was not allowed to segregate students by race because it was a second-class city, but nonetheless, it did so. Since retiring, Dan has started writing a book about Esther Brown with her daughter, Susan. And he says these kinds of laws are what made Kansas, a historically free state, such an interesting place for test cases against separate but equal. In contrast, for sure, to the states of the Confederacy, where, you know, segregation was universally the norm, this South Park case was a proving ground And in many ways, there's a direct line that can be traced from that case in South Park, Kansas, to the one in Topeka that ended the separate but equal doctrine. The one in Topeka Dan's talking about here is the famous Brown v. Board of Education case of 1954. But we'll get to that. Going back to the South Park case, in May 1948, the South Park School Board realizes a lawsuit is imminent and takes action by redefining the boundaries for the South Park and Walker schools, gerrymandering the district so that white students are officially part of the South Park district and black students are a part of the Walker School District. They had drawn a line around the home of every Negro family. And if you lived there, you went to the Walker School. And the funny thing about it was there were white families who lived much closer to the Walker School than the South Park School. There were Negro families who lived closer to the South Park School than the Walker School. This is the final straw. Five days later, the lawsuit this whole story is about, Webb v. School District 90, is filed in the Kansas Supreme Court, asking for the integration of South Park School. The plaintiffs are three boys and three girls, children of some of the most active NAACP members in the community. And one of those plaintiffs is the third woman I want you to meet, Dolores Locke Graves. She's 87 years old now, and the deplorable condition of Walker School still looms large in her memory. It was horrible as far as my mind is concerned. Not to worry, the lawyer told the Walker parents back then, This is an open and shut case. We'll get this all squared away any day now. Music to their ears. The case was filed originally, as I say, as a writ of mandamus. This is a particular writ that you can take directly to the highest court of the state to order, to mandate action that is required by the law. So they were thinking this was going to be a quick thing. A very quick thing. They thought it would be a matter of weeks, a couple of months at most. As the school board uses every delaying tactic in the book, however, the case stretches on into the summer. And Esther Brown emerges as a major leader in the effort. And something you should know about Esther is that she is an incredibly impatient person. She has no idea how long these kinds of cases take either. She quickly gets frustrated with the first lawyer, fires him, and hires Elijah Scott, a big-time civil rights lawyer out of Topeka. But even he seemingly takes too long. So she just starts calling people. People she has no real business calling. I decided to call the NAACP in New York 
and inform them of what was going on or what wasn't going on. They didn't know me from a hole in the wall. Everyone agrees. Pestering people is Esther's superpower. I've seen the reams of correspondence she conducted with NAACP lawyers, including most notably Franklin Williams, in which she's taking them to task, excoriating them for, you know, why isn't the branch here in Kansas City doing more? Other people she harasses include Thurgood Marshall, the head of the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund, and the future first black Supreme Court Justice of the United States. He comes to Esther's aid on several occasions, like the time he calls a Kansas NAACP chapter from New York to settle a fundraising dispute, reportedly bellowing into the phone, God damn it, give that white lady the money. She was like this kind of Joan of Arc character who, when she saw something wrong, she forged into battle. This is Susan, Esther's daughter again. I know I was reading some academic articles and they would say that at times, you know, people were a little bit like, Esther Brown, she's really pushing this stuff through. Driving us crazy, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's another way to say it. It's unusual for the NAACP nationally to involve themselves in this kind of a a small case. But I was halfway hysterical all the time and, and wouldn't leave them alone. I guess they had to. She could be domineering, she could be condescending, but all in service of this cause, which she was determined to see through to the end. I mean, in many ways, her chutzpah is remarkable. In fall 1948, Esther has an idea. It's the start of a new school year. Why don't the kids just try and enroll, see what happens? I thought that maybe the school board people would have had a a new think or a new look, and maybe they would accept the South Park children. So on the first day of school, Esther and some parents personally march some of the kids to the new South Park school just to see if they can't be enrolled. And everybody just looked lovely that day. But they are quickly turned away. Nobody welcomed them, let me put it this way. And as a matter of fact, when the principal saw them there without even knowing what they wanted, he immediately called the police. Dolores Lock Graves was 11 years old back then, but she told me she still vividly remembers this day and one interaction in particular. We were standing at the front door of the South Park School. I remember this man said, you get your ass away from here. I assumed he was a Ku Klux Klan. Later, she realized who she saw was actually the head of the school board. And this day and how the kids were treated ends up spurring a really important segment of this movement. I remember getting in my mother's car and I remember several people Mothers gathering. But my feeling was that I could not see how any of those Negro parents could ever send those kids to that Walker school. Esther knows they have to do something radical to prove to the school board that they're serious. So she devises a plan. I gathered all the plaintiffs together at a meeting at the Baptist church, and I said, look, let's not accept this Walker school. Let's hire two teachers, and let's teach in two of the homes in South Park. What do you say? Hey, it's Suzanne Hogan here, popping in quick just to say that if you're enjoying this story, you might also like another episode Mackenzie reported. It's called The Golden Arches of Black Kansas City, and it's about one of the first black-owned fast food franchises in the country. It was actually just nominated for a James Beard Award, and it tells the story of two black men who take very different paths and then meet up in Kansas City on either side of a picket line. Again, that's The Golden Arches of Black Kansas City, do yourself a favor and queue it up right now by scrolling down in your feed. In fall 1948, Esther Brown calls Corinthia Nutter, who, remember, no longer teaches at Walker School. Corinthia Nutter had been fired the year before when she appealed to the school board for some improvements in the Walker School, and she was one of the best teachers. Esther tells Corinthian that the Walker parents are boycotting the school board and Walker School by starting their own school in living rooms across South Park. 
Would she consider teaching for $100 a month until the lawsuit gets settled? Despite the obvious professional risks of going against the school board again, Corinthian says yes. It was a beautiful situation. They provided their living rooms. We fixed it up as near as a classroom as we could. Corinthian teaches grades five through eight, and a teacher friend of hers, Hazel Weddington, teaches the other four grades. Hazel McCray yeah. Weddington. This is Dolores Lockgraves again, the 11-year-old plaintiff in the lawsuit. She remembers how her mom gave up their living room for the boycott school. I thought it was great. My parents were the type of parents who believed in love and taking care and honesty and all this kind of good stuff, you know. The 40 or so children who attend the boycott school become known as the Walker Walkouts. But at least two students instead begin the school year at the Walker School, which is staffed with two teachers, both with questionable credentials, according to Corinthian Nutter. The school district hoped to sort of wear the parents down by attrition, and they kept that school open in the hope that, you know, some of them would relent and give up and eventually send their kids back there. To coax parents back to Walker School, Dan Margulies says the school board offered free lunch and spread rumors that the boycott school wouldn't count as an accredited year, which didn't end up being true, but played on the parents' worst fears. When a handful of parents do succumb to the pressure and re-enroll their students at the Walker School, they receive a prompt phone call from Corinthian Nutter, encouraging them not to surrender to the school board. And it works. Some of them actually come back to the boycott school. So we thought we were going to teach all two, three months. They thought the case would come to a close. But we taught the whole year. (laughs) When pressed in an interview why she put herself out there like that, Corinthian said, schools shouldn't be for a color. They should be for children. My favorite photos from this period are these classroom-style shots of the Walker Walkout kids with their two teachers. Fists balled up, their arms crossed all defiantly, half smiling, half looking angry. You can immediately pick out Dolores, who's wearing this plaid dress with her hair back. Do you remember some of these students? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dolores remembers everyone in these photos, which is incredible, considering this all took place 75 years ago. This is Patricia Black. Patricia Black, the eight-year-old plaintiff who would go on to testify at the Kansas Supreme Court. This is uh, Alfonso Eugene Jr. Next to Corinthian and that's, and that's my cousin. These two standing here are cousins. Dolores's two second cousins, Harvey Webb and Alfonso Jr. Webb, are the first plaintiffs listed in the lawsuit, which is a particularly gutsy and dangerous move at the time. Their parents, Alfonso and Mary Webb, helped spearhead this whole thing. Alfonso Webb was very thoughtful. Whenever he said something, it was just like pearls of wisdom. For all these people, the case became unequivocally the most important thing in their lives. The parents held rummage sales and bake sales to fund the lawsuit and teacher salaries. And Esther fundraised all over the state of Kansas, making presentations to local NAACP branches, labor unions, churches. One night, she even made a pitch on stage at a Billie Holiday concert. And they did all this despite the danger they were in. Some people involved in the lawsuit lost their jobs. Others became victims of death threats and violence. The white folks were furious. And above all, they hated me. They felt that I was responsible for all of this stuff. And of course, I really wasn't. I may have been the means, but they were responsible. Being a part of this, I feel like I went through something. I went through the the Ku Klux Klan. They came down there and burnt. Some might have been straw hat fire, I don't know, but at South Park School? No, at my house where we lived. Dolores says even in the darkest times, though, the community banded together, protected each other, and kept each other motivated. Dolores remembers how her mom used to invite everyone over whenever they needed a break. Esther Brown, Corinthian Nutter. It was a beautiful sight. 
when you could see those ladies, I was the girl, but I was watching them, you know. They would come together and they would have chicken and tea and, you know, that old country living. They seemed like they loved one another. At times, the boycott was hard to financially and emotionally sustain. But whenever people suggested maybe it was time to stop, Dan Margulies says Esther held firm. She would say this boycott is very important because it shows these parents that they are able to take actions that will determine their destiny. Esther Brown was that lady who gave, uh, I would say, the other black ladies in the community courage to hold your head up. We're going to lick this case. It's, it's going to come to an end. It was like when Esther come around, it was going to be all right now. Finally, in June 1949, after they boycotted the Walker School for an entire school year, the Supreme Court of Kansas ruled that black students were legally entitled to attend South Park School. The headline in the Kansas City Call read, Victory Won by Children Who Went on Strike. It was the first grade school desegregation victory that the NAACP Legal Defense Fund had played a direct role in. South Park became nationally famous. And the black students, some 40 plus of them, were admitted to the newly built South Park grade school. And interestingly, that happened without incident. And to the credit of the principal of that school, he welcomed them. Dolores was there, and she's happy about it. But it wasn't easy being one of a few black students in a sea of white kids. It's hard to explain. You're there, but then you're taught to be careful. You never know what someone will do. The janitors are white, the cafeteria is white, counselors are white. They had nothing to black to say, this is uh, someone you can go to if needed. For this reason, when Dolores had kids of her own much later, she spent her day off from work volunteering at their mostly white school. No one was there for me when I was there, but I got a chance to be there for our black children. As for Corinthian Nutter, she went on to teach at multiple schools in Olathe, Kansas. By the time she retired in 1972, she had received her master's degree in education and had risen to the role of principal at Westview Elementary, which was nearly all white. A black principal at a mostly white school That is a long way from Corinthian's roots at Walker School. And part of the reason things changed so much is because of what the South Park legal victory set into motion all the way back in 1949. As a result of the Kansas Supreme Court decision, Johnny Mission High School was integrated as well. And all the students, six or seven of them, black students who integrated that school, graduated and went on to college. That's amazing. I love that. How did Esther feel after this decision? I think she was jubilant because this long battle had finally resulted in a positive outcome. But she was also not one to rest on her laurels. She immediately, she had already before even, began to agitate for the integration of schools across the entire state. Amid the celebration of the South Park win, Esther Brown was elected to the board of directors of the Kansas State NAACP, which was then on the hunt for a segregation case that could be taken all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. I mean, she saw this case in South Park as a springboard for action elsewhere in the state. She was determined to see to it that every public school in the entire state was integrated. When Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka started materializing, several of the same players from the South Park case were tapped to lead the charge. People like Elijah Scott and Thurgood Marshall. We have got before us a job for the future. And it's not the type of job that can be solved solely by government. It's a type of job that has to be solved by individuals working on individual. Finally, on May 17, 1954, 
the United States Supreme Court ruled that school segregation violated the U.S. Constitution. The court said separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Some credit Esther Brown with convincing Oliver Brown, a black Topeka minister, no relation, to sign on as the lead plaintiff. Others say it was thanks to Esther's tireless fundraising skills that Brown v. Board was successful. Whatever it was, when the community in Topeka gathered a few days after the decision to celebrate, Esther got on the podium and told the crowd, it is the little people like us who bring about such things as Monday's Supreme Court opinion. The most brilliant lawyers couldn't have succeeded but for the help of people like you here tonight. 70 years after the Brown v. Board decision, we still have a long way to go before education in the United States is equal for students of all races and incomes. All that said, Brown was, and still is, a milestone achievement. And it likely wouldn't have played out in the same way if it hadn't been for Webb v. School District 90, five years earlier. You can see the local appreciation all over Johnson County today, in exhibits, and historical markers. In fact, just this past March, I was at the new Miriam Plaza branch of the Johnson County Library when a meeting room was dedicated to Alfonso and Mary Webb, community activists whose late sons were the first two plaintiffs listed in the lawsuit. At one point, their son, Victor Webb, got up to speak with his grandkid in tow. You wonder why I got these sunglasses on? Because I have a tendency to get a little emotional <laughs> when I'm talking about my family. And all I got to say is this. Once upon a time, right down the street, there's a school called South Park. In his speech, he echoed Esther's words 70 years ago. It wasn't about him. It wasn't just about his family. It was about all of the people who came together in this community to stand up against the school board. People like Corinthian Nutter and Dolores Lock Graves and Esther Brown. And together, they took the case and they won. And in this nation that we live in, we need to continue to fight because it ain't over. It's not over. I know that's right. Can I get a witness? Thank <laughs> you, know. A People's History of Kansas City is a production from KCUR Studios. It's co-hosted by me, Suzanne Hogan, and Mackenzie Martin. This episode was reported, produced, and mixed by Mackenzie Martin with editing by Barb Shelley and me. Special thanks this episode to the Johnson County Museum, David McKeel, Dan Margulies, Greg Rickey, and Susan Brown Tucker, who provided additional archival audio of Corinthian Nutter in addition to Esther Brown. Music this episode from Count Basie and his orchestra, Benny Moten's Kansas City Orchestra, and Blue Dot Sessions. All right, that's it. Let us know what you thought of this episode by emailing us at peopleshistorykc at kcur.org. We also have a Facebook group you can join for more stories about Kansas City's past. And if you like this podcast, please consider writing us a review or sharing it with a friend. We'll be back in June with a story about a Kansas underdog that may surprise you. Until then, I'm Suzanne Hogan. Thanks for listening.